God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. It is, it is so good to be with you. We were singing that song about with all creation, I sing praise to the King of Kings. That is great. I look forward to the days uh, in eternity when we're no longer counting the days and we're singing with absolutely everybody and we're all singing the same song. And we're all looking right at that throne of grace. But this morning, I'm just really happy to be singing with all of you. I like this part of at God's kingdom right here. We're, we're continuing on in our 40-day prayer journey with the wider Alliance family. If you haven't joined us on that, I thought there were 26 days and Justice said 25. I think it depends on whether or not you count today. I think there's still 26 days, which is uh, a lot of time still to give yourself an agreed prayer uh, with your church, with thousands of others uh, in our missionary movement who are seeking after the face of God together. So I want to encourage you to do that. As Justin said, you can find all the resources on our website. It's out there. You can get things sent to your inbox. We're posting the devotionals every day on our Facebook page. If you don't have a printed copy, we've got those. I can still get that to you. But come and pray with us. Um, pray with us here. Pray with us in your home. Pray with us at work. Pray with us in your car. Just keep your eyes open if you're praying in your car, please. Amen. Jed. Our theme. Our theme. Chloe. Yesterday of the mood, Chloe was zonking out riding in the car, too. It's got to be a circuit thing. So our theme for both today and the week that is ahead of us is prayer as petition. Open your Bibles and your hearts with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking again, same text we've been looking at, verses 9 through 13. We're going to look at that with a little bit of a different emphasis this morning as Jesus teaches us how to pray. And as you find your place there with me, I want to ask that you find your place on your feet with me. If you're able to stand in reverence to what God has spoken, this is the word of God. These are the words of God the Son, given to us by the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. Let's receive them as such. Jesus says, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. How long, church? Forever. Amen. Say it with me if you believe it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Whoever has used to hear this morning, let them hear. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we, as we turn our eyes to the kind of prayer that asks, God, I think, I think it's fitting that we remember all that you've already given us, Lord, not just uh, in this part of the world where we have so much compared to so many, but uh, even where we are in human history, our, our part of that, we were especially full, we are especially satisfied. You are the God who has supplied all of our needs and then some. God, so our only request this morning that we're going to bring before you right now, uh, before we look against your word is that you would open our eyes, help us to see the wonderful things that you have to give us in your word this morning. I pray that you change us by it. I'm believing that you will honor that prayer. We won't leave here like we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. As I said, our, our theme for this morning as we approach this week, the halfway uh, mark in our 40-day prayer journey is prayer as Petition. We're focusing on the asking side of things this morning, the give us this day side of things this morning. And, and of course, bread, if we're looking at the exact words of Jesus here, bread symbolizes our most basic need. If we don't eat, we don't live. Right? Not very long, anyway. Uh, there's a few of you that are saying, Pastor, remember that when we get close to noon. If we don't eat, we don't live. And I, I, my stomach growls, too. It's more dangerous for me because I'm Mike. So I'm, I'm very aware of that. But... Uh, this morning, especially since this is our second series in the Lord's Prayer in a short amount of time, it's my second shot of this verse, what I want to do is I want to widen our lens just a little and consider how it is that we're to ask anything of God. A petition's just a request. When we come to God with a petition, we're asking Him to do something. We're asking Him to do something for ourselves. We're asking Him to do something for someone else. And I believe this ought to be a very intentional part of our praying. We need to take advantage of the welcome God's given us. This is the kind of praying, this is how we receive 
those gifts that he has for us. This is how we receive his resources so that we can walk in his purposes. That's the goal. That's what we're aiming for. If, if we pray like Jesus has been teaching us to pray here, we've already brought the kingdom into it, right? That comes first. Your kingdom comes before I start asking for these other things. That was last week's message, his kingdom and his will. Anything we ask then after that is going to be directed by those things. John wrote, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When you're a kingdom-focused Christian with kingdom-focused prayers and the will of God is coming first, your petitions are going to have a context of confidence. It's going to change the way you pray. It's going to change the way that you live. You will live differently. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. I think someone needs to hear that today. Someone's probably me, but it might be one of you too. Be anxious for nothing. What are you anxious for this morning? He gives us an alternative. He says, but. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that's remembering the things that God has already done, remembering the ways that God has already provided for you, let your request be made known to God. He wants to hear. So I'll start with this this morning. The Bible teaches us to petition God boldly when we pray. One of my favorite verses in all of the word that God's given us is James 5, 17, and it says this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain on the earth, and it did not rain for three years and six months. And if you want to read the story behind that, it's in 1 Kings 17, chapter 17. And I want to point out to you that all the while, at the beginning of that story and at the end of that story, when the rain starts coming again, when he starts seeing the rain return, Elijah was hearing from God, beginning to end. You look at that. First Kings 17, look at it. Verse 2, the word of the Lord came to him, it says. Verse 8, the word of the Lord came to him. You'll find that he did according to that word. It says that. The word of the Lord came to him, he did according to that word. He wasn't just hearing it, he was doing it. We get that more than once in chapter 17. You get to chapter 18, the word's still coming to him, and he's still doing it. Why am I telling you that? Because when we seek God in his word, he still speaks to us. That's where it begins. He still speaks to us. When Jesus was confronted by the Sadducees, Matthew 22, he asked a very weirdly worded question. He said, have you not read... What was spoken to you by God? So he refers to the scriptures. Have you not read as that which was spoken, right? He doesn't say, have you not read what was written to you? That would make more sense. He says, have you not read what was spoken? And he says, spoken to you. He's talking to people that are right in front of him. And that the passage that he refers to, you look at that. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the I am. He's referring to something that was thousands of years old. At that time, it's thousands more years old in our time. And he says, this was God speaking to you. Same is true for us. Hebrews says the word of God is living and it's active. He instructs us. He reveals his nature to us. And not only his nature, listen, our nature. When we look into his word, he gives us the understanding we need in our lives to live in a way that is pleasing to him, that glorifies him. We are learning as we are looking. Who we're praying to, how we're to pray, what we're to pray for. And so our prayers are going to become naturally more effective to the degree that our hearts have been softened and that our hearts have been molded by the word of God. See, the key to answer prayer is praying in faith. You knew that, right? The key to answer prayer is praying in faith. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word, Romans 10. That's the secret. It's not much of a secret. It's printed in every Bible you've got here. It's printed in all the few Bibles. It's printed in the most published printed book in the world. It's everywhere. That's the secret. Did you pray this week? How much did you talk to God this week? Were you, were you listening first? Proverbs says, if you turn your ear away from listening to what God said, it says your prayer is an abomination. Think about that. Go, go and seek out. You can do a study on this. Go and seek out what kind of other things God uses that word for, abomination. Some of them are coming into your mind if you're familiar with the Old Testament. 
What does God call, call an abomination? He calls idolatry, bowing down before idols, bowing down before things that are not God. He calls that an abomination, child sacrifice. Child sacrifice, he calls an abomination, right? Sexual immorality, it's an abomination. Taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of the elderly, God calls those things abominations. And he says, if you don't listen to what I've said, if you turn your ear away from my law and you pray, he calls that an abomination. But Elijah did listen. He didn't do that. Elijah listened. The word of the Lord came to him. He received it. He responded it. So James 5, 17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. He prayed that it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain. Three and a half years, church. But I always want to point out to you the most amazing part of this verse. It's not that it didn't rain. That's pretty amazing. That's incredible. We've had some droughts before, but compared to this, we have not. It's not that it didn't rain as an answer to prayer. That is more incredible. It's, it's getting there. That's more incredible. But it's that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was like us, and it didn't rain on account of his praying. That's incredible. That is amazing. That's so incredible that it's sort of hard to believe, maybe. I think that's why James reminds us of it. That's why I'm reminding you this morning. Elijah was a man like you and like me. And so it would be like if any one of us, any one of us here, started just restlessly and, and, and eagerly and expectantly going to God, praying that it wouldn't rain. And as a direct result of that, he rolled back the clouds until not a drop of rain fell on this valley until July of 2026. My boy turns about five. That's what this would look like in our context. That is incredible. And if you think about it, not only, not only do we have the same nature as Elijah, it's more than that. I want you to understand this. It's way more than that. We're on this side of the cross. We have the full revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, in the Son of God who took on flesh and came here, as John says in his first chapter, to reveal to us what God is like. We know it more. We have, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, the permanent and dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God. We have him. More than that, we have the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We know him by name. And he bids us to come to him with all of our burdens. He calls us friends. He calls us, the scriptures say, he's not ashamed to call us even his brothers. We've got something a little bit more than Elijah even. And through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, from the dead, at every turn, everything you see Jesus doing, everything you see Jesus saying, he showed himself. Jesus, our brother, showed himself to be a loving and sympathetic Savior. Jesus cares like nobody else. Do you know that this morning? Jesus cares like nobody else. Do you know him? 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're told that God is the only sovereign one, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that he dwells in unapproachable light. If you've been with us for very long in my ministry, you've heard me say this probably a dozen times. Some of you might not have heard it before, so I'm going to say it again. I want to show you what Jesus did for you. Look at these two verses. Our God, according to the scripture, dwells in unapproachable light, right? But not only are we to approach... As believers, we are told, approach, but because of the mercy of the cross, and that, that, should be, that should be shocking enough to begin with, that we would be told to approach. I think that shocks angels. Peter says they long to look at what's going on over here. That should be shocking enough, but we're to approach God who dwells in unapproachable light, and we're to do it with boldness. Hebrews says we're to approach with confidence. Son of God, Jesus Christ, the righteous, he paid for that. He bought that for us at the cost of his own blood. That is huge. You get that this morning. You understand the privilege we have as believers, what we're called into, that, that, that you, I mean personalize this, you, just think about your week. Think about what you did this week. Think about what you didn't do maybe that you should have done this week. Think about what you said this week. Think about those things you didn't say, but you thought it, and God heard it just the same. He still tells you, not only to approach him, dwells in unapproachable light. He not only tells you to approach, but he tells you to approach with boldness. Can you even imagine 
anyone doing that, that's stepping uh, through those ancient doors we read about in Psalms, climbing up to the highest place in heaven, past those creatures we read about in Isaiah 6 who, who hide their eyes all the time and all they can cry out is holy, 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 and here comes you and the scriptures say with unveiled face, you not only come up to the throne of God expecting him to listen to anything you have to say at all, but then you hold out your hand and you say give. Can you even imagine that? Jesus tells you not only to imagine that, Jesus tells you to do it. Have you taught us to pray? Give us this day. Approach. Give us. Extend that hand and ask that God would give you something before you go. Not only does it show the character of God, the word says... As soon as we start praying, you read Daniel 9, you read Daniel 10, as soon as we start praying, angels respond, God sends them. Hebrews says they're ministering spirits set forth from the throne of God to minister to his people. As soon as we start praying, the angels are sent, and if that wasn't enough, God sent his own son as a man to tell us to not stop asking. Ask and keep on asking. Be persistent, Jesus said. He taught us persistence. He, 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 he gave us two parables talking about this this morning downstairs. He gave us two parables. They were only seven chapters apart, both on persistence in prayer. He was persistent in telling us how we're to be persistent in approaching him. It's amazing. <laughs> Keep on asking. The, the older saint, they would call that praying through something. There's this, there's this problem. There's this issue. There's this need. I've got to pray through it. Have persistence until the assurance of the answer comes. You know what I mean? One minute miracles. Things that, that took God just a moment to accomplish. It was months and months of praying. As I said, some of you are in this room today. You can have conversations with the answers to some of my prayers today. I'm excited about that. That's wonderful. A bold prayer of petition asks big and asks often. A bold prayer of petition knows that our God is the God of Ephesians 3.20, that he's able to do far more. Somebody say far more. He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. I can ask a lot. I do. And I can certainly think a lot. Sometimes I think too much. You know that no matter what you can ask, no matter what you can think, all that you could ever ask of God isn't even all that he intends to do through you. You realize that this morning, that that's who we're dealing with. The, the Bible teaches us to petition God boldly when we pray. And we ought to pray boldly. Why wouldn't we? We got this promise. We got this promise given to us. We know what this promise cost him to give us. How eager he is. Luke chapter 12 says, It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says, pray for the kingdom. The Bible teaches us to petition God boldly when we pray, but the Bible also teaches us to petition God humbly when we pray. Because God alone is all-powerful. He has complete authority over our lives, over our judgment, over our salvation. So we need to come to him in a posture of humility, recognizing every time we do that, that his place, that his power, that his position is so much greater than our own. And every Sunday, we, we read the text. What is it that we say afterwards? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. You know, according to verse 7, the grass is you. You are the thing that, that, that withers and fades away. We're not made out of much. When you, when you take away the breath of God from us, we're not made out of much. I remember a time, a couple years back, I had a chart. I tried to find it. I didn't have that saved anywhere. But I had a chart that had like the chemical compounds of the material makeup of our bodies, what we are physically. Like there's enough iron in us to make maybe one decent nail that wouldn't bend when you hit it with a hammer. Like we can make a nail out of the iron in our bodies, maybe just enough magnesium to take one photograph, enough sodium to fill three or four salt shakers. All that to say that, that although you are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says that in Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, but you're still made out of dust. You are still made out of dust. A humble prayer of petition seeks to make known our desires to God while submitting ourselves to his plan, no matter what. In the garden on the night of his arrest, the one who taught us to pray by expression, he taught us to pray by example that night. The one who gave us this model prayer, he modeled it. 
that night. Three times he said to his father, let this cup pass from me. It was the cup of suffering, the cup of God's wrath, mixed to full strength. This is the cup that the prophets wrote about. I got Jeremiah on the screen for you. This is the cup that the prophets wrote about. All of the sin of the world was filling this cup all the way up to the brim, to overflowing. It is the wrath of God poured out. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus models this. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He modeled this too. Look at his prayer. This is the Damascus Road disciple of Jesus. He got the assignment and he understood. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. The master of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. We don't know what this was. A couple books have been written about that, but it's really all speculation. In my somehow a long list of questions I'm going to ask God and people when I get there, one day I'm going to ask Paul, what was the thorn in his flesh? I was about there's going to be millions of people asking him that. And so like the new thorn in the flesh is going to be me and all of you. Paul, what was it? You'd be annoyed with that. But he says, concerning this, concerning this thorn, he says, I implored the Lord three times to take it away from me. Reflecting Jesus, three times. Paul had a need. He had an affliction. He asked three times for God to take it away. Take it away, God. God, please take it away. God, take it away, please. God said, I'm not going to take it away. Sometimes he says that. God didn't remove the Red Sea when Israel stood in front of it. He parted it. He didn't remove it. He's not always going to remove your problem. He will make a way through your problem. He's promised his presence. He's promised the way. God says, I'm not going to take it away. Paul, he says, but I'm going to give you something. God says, I'm going to give you my grace. One word I want to point out to you. My grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. It's enough. You don't know what to pray for one morning you wake up? Pray for grace. More grace, Lord. That's all I need today, just a little bit more grace. His grace is sufficient. It's enough. So here's, here's the question for you. Here's how to kind of bring these ideas together. The Bible teaches us that we're to petition God boldly. teaches us that we're to petition God humbly. How do we do that at the same time? I want to bring those ideas together. Turn to Genesis 18. Give me that nice page turning sound. Genesis 18. I'm going to give you an example that I think does that, brings these things together. Give you a little bit of a backstory while we're getting there. So years before this, what we're about to look at, years before this, Abraham and his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot, they, they leave where they were. They go to the promised land, a place called Canaan. Somewhere along the way, they got a part company. See, because God's blessing them in their obedience so much that the little that they left with becomes too much for the land to sustain them. The word says that. So God's blessing them. They got a part company. Lot settles down in a, in a sinful kind of a city you've probably heard of called Sodom. That's where he goes and he lives out by the Dead Sea. And, and this war breaks out. A bunch of kings get together. They attack Sodom. They sack it. They take its wealth. They take Lot off as a slave. They, they haul him out of there. Abraham hears about it. It's still his nephew, even if they're not together all that often. He hears about this and he does something that I'm amazed. I don't think they've ever made a movie about it, and they need to. He goes and he makes his own little army, Abraham. And he goes back in the middle of the night and he fights them all and he wins. And he gets his nephew back and he takes him back home. They need to make a movie about that. Abraham's like the Liam Neeson of the Old Testament. And I think Liam Neeson has to be the one to play him if they ever do. <laughs> but now we're, we're in everybody, Genesis 18, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> Genesis 18, give me an amen if you're in Genesis 18. Amen. Be more amen. It's Genesis 18, I'll put it on the screen, you can cheat. Now Lot is facing a greater danger, right? Before King's devastation, hardship, he's in slavery. Now Lot's facing a danger that's far greater because God himself is aligning against Sodom. That's worse than the combined power of every king you can think of. It's not his intention to take prisoners either. He's not doing what they did. Abraham's entertaining three strangers at this part in the chapter. Two of them turn out to be angels. One of them turns out to be God himself. Look at verse 17. Don't miss this first part. It is very important. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That promise was fulfilled, is being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the son of Abraham, according to Matthew chapter 1. That's what God meant. Verse 19, For I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord 
by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he's spoken about him. So he's going to tell him his plan. Verse 20. The Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. Their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me. And if not, I will know. A few chapters before this, God told Abraham about the sin of the Amorites. He said, It's not quite full yet. Not quite time to judge the Amorites. It is time to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he tells them. God's merciful. <clears throat> Understand this morning, God is merciful. He is kind. He is patient. He is everything we sing about him and everything else we haven't yet sung about him that is good and reflects him. He gives chance after chance to people and to places. Some of you maybe are on your third or fourth or fifth chance. Run to him. You don't know how many chances you have. Run to him today. He's merciful. But eventually the time comes for God's judgment. And for these cities, that time was now. Chapter 13 said they were greatly wicked. Abraham knew it. They were known for that. And he knows because of God's great righteousness and God's holiness that God means what he's saying. Abraham gets that. But Lot's there. Right? His nephew's there. So look at verse 23. Abraham says, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Remember what I said about listening to God's word about how our prayers are naturally more effective to the degree that our hearts have been softened and molded by his word. The key to answered prayer is praying in faith, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, Romans 10, 17. Think about this. God has just talked about Abraham's destiny, hasn't he? How he, he chose him, how he was going to bless the world through him, how he was going to raise up his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. If God expects justice in Abraham, if that's what the way of the Lord is, then the Lord is just. Abraham's calling back to God's own character. He's got faith in what God has just said, which... By the way, is how he was declared righteous before God in the first place, by believing God, by hearing his word. I trust it. I believe it. So knowing who God is, knowing what God says, Abraham prays in this way. God says, all right, if there's 50, I'll spare him. Abraham replied, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. There's your humility. Here comes the boldness. Suppose the 50 righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? God says, I will not destroy it if 45 are there. He spoke to him yet again and said, suppose 40 are there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the 40. Then he said again, he's not done. Not even close. He said, oh, may the Lord not be angry and I shall speak. I don't think the Lord was angry with him. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray, taught us to pray with persistence. He wants us to pray in that way. He wants us to pray through things. In fact, I think, I think Abraham was set up by God to do this. He was telling him what he was going to do so that Abraham would pray in this way. He says, suppose 30 are bound there. God said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are bound there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 20. And then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose 10 are found there. Every time I read that, I cringe a little. I get nervous. I know how it ends. I get nervous, Abraham praying like this. But then God says, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. Why does God bargain with this man? I want you to think about this this morning. Couldn't he have just said, enough is enough, I'm the judge? I'm always just, I can destroy them all if I want to, because even the most righteous among them, if you want to find ten, the most righteous among them has at some point sinned against me, and the soul that sins shall die. And since I'm the one that decides when people die, it's not your place to talk me out of it. He could have said that, right? But he doesn't. Instead, he listens. 
And then he speaks. And then Abraham listens. And Abraham speaks humbly and boldly at the same time. And this, this wonderfully terrifying conversation takes place where we see just how far Abraham's faith is going to take him. And I think God was pleased by that, that, that Abraham trusted him enough to pray like this, that he was still the man who believed God. And I want you to notice in his bargaining, and I hope that this will influence your prayer life, I want you to notice in his bargaining that Abraham's not bringing anything to the table but God's character and his word. He's not haggling. He's not making a whole bunch of promises. He, he's just appealing to God's grace. That's it. This is the kind of petition that he doesn't demean the God we're praying to as if I could offer him something that he needs. Doesn't cheapen his answer by making it some kind of transaction. It's prayer built on faith, built on the word. I want to show you something. Prayer, prayer doesn't change God's will. Make that clear. Prayer does not change God's will. But it lets us participate in the fulfillment of God's will by bringing us into his presence and purposes. In a way that we will only see if we take the step of faith and start praying. God's not going to go against his will. He's not going to go against his character. He's not going to go against his word. But he can work those things out in a lot of different ways. And God honors prayer. I believe, as the word says in Daniel 4, he does as he pleases in heaven and on earth. I believe that not one hair on your head turns white or black without his decree. I believe that he's in full control, not just of some things, but all things. I don't believe in chance. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in random, although I sometimes use the word. I don't really believe that. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I also believe that what James wrote matters. You have not because you ask not. And I can't explain that. I don't have to because the scriptures don't explain it. It just says it. It's true. Those words don't mean the opposite of what they say. Prayer changes things. Prayer causes things to happen that would not otherwise happen if you didn't pray. God honors prayer. I'll show you. Look how God answers. Think about how all this story wraps up. What was the intent of Abraham's praying? Why was he praying for the deliverance of Sodom in the first place? God's righteousness. And his nephew, Lot, was there. Well, Sodom burns up. It is just as famous for that as being sinful, right? We all know that. Sodom burns up. But God snatches Lot up out of there. He sends an angel to literally drag him out. Abraham prays, and God grants the intent of his petition, even if it doesn't end up looking like he would have imagined it would look like. God is righteous, and he's powerful, and his righteousness and his power come. His kingdom comes. So then let our petitions come. I want to invite you, and I'm only passing along the invitation of God. Have you not read what was spoken to you? I want to invite you to pray boldly. I want to invite you to pray humbly. Pray with the word and the will of God directing your petitions. And I want to invite you to pray with persistence until the answer comes. Father, we thank you that you hear us. Make us bolder in our asking, even as we come to you. God, in our Humility, recognizing that we are just dust. Because we, we also recognize that the, the Son of God took on a body of dust, and he walked in the dust, and he was buried in the dust to bring us into a relationship with you. And, and so as you've raised him from the ground to the right hand of power, we pray that you would raise us in our praying, in our spirits, to that same place. And God, that you would help us and that you would encourage us, even in that place, to raise our hands with expectation and to say you. Expectation, God, that you are who you say you are. Help us to believe that. In Jesus, mighty. Amen. You know, when I think about Abraham, and I, I, I think about that story, and I see him interceding for this city, and I see him interceding for uh, Lot, I, I can't help but think of Jesus. I can't help but think of Jesus 
interceding for us. When we're at our worst, the scriptures say, when we are at our worst, when we're in rebellion, when we're in sin against him, it's then that Jesus comes, interceding for us. The word says in 1 John that he is our advocate. The word says in 1 Timothy that he's our mediator, the only one. The word says in Romans that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So how's that for persistence? He's still teaching us persistence. And the word says in Hebrews that he is able to save forever those who draw near to God because of that. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. I wonder if you believe today, maybe something you've never believed before. Maybe you've heard it before, but you've never believed it before. And it, it took maybe persistence. And it took boldness. And it took humility. It took my petition to God and my petition to you to be reconciled to him. The word says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that if that is you. Pray with me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me by the Christ that's been preached here today. I believe. Save me by the Christ who died on the cross for me. Rose from the grave. God, I believe it was for my sins. I don't want my sins to separate us. Please come into my life. Make me new. Make me yours. Jesus is Lord. If you want to be saved this morning, I want you to say that last part with me. Say it out loud. Jesus is Lord.